Hi, I'm Yann Terming, and I'll be presenting this paper entitled Structural Reductions Revisited. We're interested in checking properties of Petri nets. For instance, does my net contain a deadlock, or can this uh, equation be an invariant of the Petri net? So how does this work? Essentially, we start from the initial state of the net, and then we explore this very vast and complex object, which is called the state space, or the reachable markings. And if we can find a bad state, that is, a deadlock state or a violation of the invariant, then we have a verdict. So if the state space does not intersect the bad states, then the invariant is true. Otherwise, we say the invariant is false, not preserved by the net. Now, the approach we're going to present in this paper is based in three elements. The first one is over-approximation that can formally prove that invariants that are true uh, are preserved, hold. The second approach is under-approximation <coughs> that can contradict false invariants using a counterexample. And the third element that gives its name to this uh, paper is a set of property preserving structural reduction rules. So let's start with the over-approximation using SMT. The idea here is that rather than considering this very complex real state space object, we can try to compute a kind of envelope of these states such that all reachable states are within the envelope. And this could be a much smaller and simpler object than the actual state space. Then we can reason between the uh, intersection of the envelope and the bad states so if we are lucky and uh, the envelope does not intersect the bad states, we have actually proved that uh, the invariant holds. Otherwise, we're not really sure, because it could be here a false positive, or it could actually be a true violation of the invariant. So how do we do this? Well, the idea is to go incrementally, start from a very rough appro approximation, and then, little by little, add constraints, add constraints that will reduce the size of this box uh, until hopefully we can conclude. So there's a series of constraints we add into the problem one by one. I'm not going to present all of these uh, in this presentation, uh, but we'll focus on a few of these. The first one is the trap constraint. So a trap is a set of places of the net such that uh, any transition that consumes from this set must also feed the trap. And it was identified by, uh, in a paper by uh, Javier Espasa that this is actually a very good complement to state equation that allows to conclude for some mutual exclusion protocols. A trap is a set of places in the net that can never be emptied because any transition that consumes from them must also feed them. Unfortunately, there are worst case exponential number of traps. So proactively adding all the traps constraints we could find to the problem would be uh, counterproductive. So instead what we do is we have this iterative process where each time we find a candidate solution using the main solution procedure, we're going to try to use a separate SMT instance to find a trap uh, that contradicts this candidate solution. If we can find it, well, we add a constraint to the main solution engine. Otherwise, we know that there are no trap constraints we can add. The second type of constraint I want to discuss here is a new kind of read implies feed constraint. So the idea here is that the state equation does not actually see self loops. So here to fire T1, we need P to be marked. But the state equation won't be aware of this because the effect of T1 is simply to move tokens from here to here. Uh, so what we can do is reason on the first occurrence of each transition. And here we can use a firing count of T1 and T2 and say that if T1 is positive, then it must be the case that T2 is positive as well. Somebody must have fed P. An extension of this rule that generalizes to actual cycles is um, represented here. So what we do here is we introduce a partial order over the occurrence of each transition in the net, and we try to check uh, if it is preserved. The idea is that in this example, we're going to say that, well, to fire T1, we need somebody to have fed this place. In this case, T2 is the only option. 
Therefore, if T1 is positive, T2 must be positive, and T2 must precede T1. But if we apply the same rule for T2, we can see that T2 must be preceded by T1, leading to a contradiction. If instead we have this kind of model, then we can find a solution where we'll say, okay, so T3 precedes T2 and T2 precedes T1, and we're happy. And the cycle is now, in fact, satisfiable. So these are very new constraints that have not been proposed in the literature and that uh, complement the state equation, which is particularly weak uh, with respect to this kind of cyclic behavior with borrowed tokens. Okay, the second approach now. Uh, we've just seen that the SMT can prove invariants that are true, but what about invariants that are not preserved? Well, the idea here is that we're going to simply start from the initial state and proceed by under approximation by simply running through the net and see if we can be lucky and actually hit a bad state. So if we hit a bad state, well, we know the invariant does not hold and we have a counterexample we can exhibit. Otherwise, of course, we can't really conclude because we might have been unlucky and explored, I don't know, this part of the state space and never met the bad state, even though it was possible to meet it. So to do this sampling, what we do is essentially use a very fast, sparse engine. And what we did in this work, although there are many other options to choose from, was to run a simple memoryless exploration with several different heuristics that strongly bias uh, path we're going to take. And the idea here is that uh, try to find uh, uh, counter examples. It's, it scales well. The third approach, which gives the name to the paper, are these property-specific structural reduction rules. So the idea is we're going to apply a set of rules that start from a net n and go to a net n prime, such that uh, n prime satisfies the property of in the property we're looking at if and only if n satisfies the property we're looking at. Of course, anytime we simplify the net by removing parts of it or by accelerating over parts of the net, the effect on the state space is usually exponential. So if we can, as in this example, reduce the net progressively to reach this object, which has only three states, whereas the original net had uh, 10 to the 12 states. This means in the end, we can analyze this smaller net using any technique you, you like. Huh? So why are these reduction rules property specific? Well, we, are, we separate two cases here for structural reduction rules. The first one is deadlock detection. And we're based on the idea that <clears throat> for there not to be a deadlock, it must be the case that there's some unavoidable loop within the net where some tokens will be trapped and will indefinitely go around. Therefore, there's always a transition that can be fired and there is no deadlock. So this means that the only thing that is really interested are are SECs in the net. If we look at this example here, we can see, in fact, just looking at the structure, well, there's no SEC. So, well, there must be a deadlock. And we can conclude immediately. Otherwise, when there are SECs, we're going to keep the SECs and prefix of these SECs that can put tokens in them. And then we're going to discard anything that is uh, in a suffix of, a, of an SEC. For invariants, we have a different strategy. So the idea here is that my invariant is only looking at very few places of the net. And what we want is to look at the projection of reachable states over the places in the support of the invariant, so the places P1, P2, P3 here. And, well, this is the only thing we're really interested in. If we look at this example, we can use a different algorithm called the prefix of interest to compute that, in fact, the only places that can causally affect the markings of the three red places are the places in black here, this region of the net. And all this complex structure here around is actually not relevant with respect to the invariant we're looking at and can be immediately discarded. So how do we do these uh, kind of rules? Well, the idea is that we can uh, we, we introduce some graph-based rules <coughs> where we're going to reason with an abstraction of uh, the actual uh, net structure. And the idea is there's an edge from P1 <coughs> to P2 
if and only if the marking of P1 can causally affect the marking of P3. So as you can see here, because P1 controls this transition, P1 is indeed causally affecting how the markings I can reach in P3, and P2 as well, because obviously the tokens in it can go to P3. However, we can see that P2 does not influence the marking of P1, because this is actually just a read arc. So we have this kind of slight asymmetry, and we consider here this safety influence graph, and then within this graph, we're going to only consider the prefix of places that are uh, inside the support of the invariant we're considering. So if we look at this small example here, we're only looking for the, the marking of this red place. Well, we see this is a loop that is controlled by the fact there is or not a token in this place, but, well, this loop cannot impact the, the, the states of, this, of the rest of the net, Therefore, it can simply be discarded and uh, simplified. The second rule I'm presenting here is called free agglomeration, and is a new kind of agglomeration that complements pre- and post-agglomeration. So the idea here is that I have a transition that is only feeding this place P1, and then, well, P1 will lead to some other future with some other output transitions. And the idea here is that if T1 is stuttering, that is, it's not actually impacting the, the support variable, so no, none of its uh, pre-places are in the support, and P1 is not in the support, well, then we can actually perform an agglomeration. This means we redirect the arcs that are going to T2 back to T1, and uh, construct this fused transition T1 point T2. This reduces uh, interlacement in the state space, so it's a strong reduction. And the problem is that this only preserves safety properties. Because in the case of deadlocks, the fact that we can put tokens in here and then maybe we can never manage to mark P2, well, these are tokens will be locked and then maybe this could lead us to a deadlock. Um, but for uh, safety properties, we don't really care. Because if we can put tokens in here, well, this is stuttering behavior. So the only way we can really observe the fact that we put tokens here is if we fire T2 and do something else after it, with it. Huh? Uh, but because T1 has no other outputs than P1, each time you fire T1, we're actually weakening the behaviors that the net can, uh, can reach. Because we know that for uh, ordinary Petri nets, uh, the less tokens you put in there, the less behaviors you can reach. So the rest of the net is weakened by firing T1. And this is not, this is not interesting unless we can actually uh, fire a continuation T2. So losing this uh, behavior where we stuck some tokens in here and then could not get them out is actually irrelevant with regards to safety. Another rule I want to present here is a rule that uses the SMT over approximation engine we saw in the first part to uh, actually push our reductions further. So the notion of structurally implicit place is found in the literature. Uh, Jose Manuel Colom worked a lot on this in particular. So the idea is that essentially a place is implicit if it's useless, it does not actually control the behavior. So if any time I want to fire a transition that is actually eating from this place, and um, I can prove that, uh, well, the place is always sufficiently marked to fire it, if all the other preconditions are sufficiently marked to fire, I can just simply discard this place and obtain a simpler net. So how do we do this? Well, we can build a, uh, an invariant that is saying, okay, uh, if the transition is otherwise sufficiently um, fed to fire, uh, if there are enough tokens in all the other input places of T to fire, then P always contains enough tokens to fire. So the advantage of this uh, rule is that uh, if we look at the ordinary reduction rules, at some point we reduce, we reduce, and we get a little bit stuck. So here, starting from this initial model, applying our other rules, we reach this intermediate model where no more rules can be applied. But then we can do this uh, test with these uh, 
SMT engine and actually find in this example that these four places which are non-trivially connected to the rest of the net are actually implicit. They have enough tokens that in fact they'll always be sufficiently marked to fire. So I can just discard them and then I have simpler transitions that uh, can be reduced now that can, uh, on which I can apply uh, structural reduction rules. And so we can go for another round of uh, iteration of uh, applying rules and reach this final model, which is uh, much smaller than this, this version. So this is very powerful, but of course it's uh, more costly than the, most of the other rules that are just looking at the normal structure of the net since we have a call to the SMT solve. So to summarize on these structural reduction rules, the paper presented to in total 22 rules. Uh, some of these are pretty basic, stuff like if two places have an equal incidence matrix, well, I can get rid of one of them. Uh, if a transition has uh, the same effect, but more preconditions than another transition, I can discard it. Uh, and then we have some more advanced rules, uh, like uh, the siphon rule, some rules about the future equivalent places, so two places such that for every output transition of one, there's a kind of a symmetric equivalent uh, transition that takes from the other one, and even some new rules that involve token movement. This is in the case that we could agglomerate a place, but it is initially marked, which is a precondition which is preventing the application of agglomeration, well then, if there is a single output for this place and it's stuttering, let's move the token out of there so we can actually perform the agglomeration. This is a good idea. Then we have all these agglomeration-based rules, so pre- and post-agglomeration, which are classical, and the new free agglomeration that we just saw. The graph-based rules uh, I talked about earlier, and finally these uh, rules supported by the SMT over approximation. The advantage of these structural reduction rules is that it synergizes with our two other decision procedures since, uh, well, the smaller the net, the smaller the state space, and uh, also the smaller the net, the less variables for the MCSMT constraints, and the whole thing is becoming more and more efficient. So we performed an extensive evalu evaluation using the MCC 2019 nets and formulas, in total, uh, we considered, uh, well, all the examinations for which we had known results in 2019. And this makes a total of almost uh, 2,700 examinations and almost 29,000 properties. So a pretty large benchmark. Uh, we agree with the, the expected result of the MCC in all these cases, of course, huh? And we gave it a pretty small runtime. So normally the MCC, it's one hour to solve the problem. But here we consider our tool as more like a, a filter, right? It's going to uh, remove some properties which can contradict uh, relatively easily and then simplify the net. And then uh, if it cannot fully solve because some we don't have a, a full decision procedure here, huh? So if we cannot fully solve the, the, the net, then we're going to output a smaller net that you can an analyze with uh, any other tool you like. So with this 12 minute timeout, well, uh, almost all the models were able to be treated. And on average, this is a very fast uh, procedure that only takes about 30 seconds uh, per examination. Uh, since it's fully structural, right? We're not exploring the state space, in fact, uh, in any of these methods. So for deadlocks, uh, we were able to solve almost 97% of the deadlock problems. And for invariants, 93% uh, of the examinations were fully solved. This means essentially we reach a resulting net, which is empty, and all the properties have a true or false as verdict. And uh, so 6.5% of the, of the problems end up as smaller problems with less properties uh, that can be passed to another tool. And regarding formulas, so 98% uh, of um, reachability formulas were, were, were verified. 
the, the invariance. If you, this means that in the 6.5% remaining here, actually many of these we had, we, we do have answers to quite a few of their uh, of their properties, even though we were not able to solve all 16 invariants. So. To conclude, we present the three methods and then assemble them within a workflow that has this kind of uh, structure. So first we start from the Neden property. We try this uh, random walk under approximation. If we're lucky and we hit a counterexample, well, we know the invariant does not hold. If we don't find it, we think, okay, maybe we didn't find it because it's not possible to find this, uh, this invariant because the invariant is true. So let's try to prove it. So we go to the SMT over approximation. So we start here with this rough box using reals, and then we refine, adding on constraints, adding on constraints. If at some point we're lucky and we get unsat, well, we've proved the invariant holds. We can discard it and remove it. <clears throat> Otherwise, when I get a set response, uh, well, we're actually going to look at the, the, the model uh, produced by the SMT solver and feed it back to the random walk to try to guide it to a solution. If we find a counterexample, again, uh, the invariant does not hold. Otherwise, well, we've not managed to conclude for this property, so we're going to try to apply the structural reduction rules we saw and uh, reduce, reduce the net uh, as much as we can. So if there are no more reductions to be performed, we consider we have converged and we're going to output the resulting net and property. Otherwise, we're going to loop back here and do this procedure again. So the idea, we arrived here with a net and a property when it's deadlock or a net and 16 properties for the, the invariance uh, in the model checking contest. And so here we're going to be, each time we find uh, an answer for some properties, we're going to be able to reduce the size of the support here, the red places. And uh, when there are less red places, there are more structural reductions we can apply. So we, we loop uh, around here until we, we converge. Uh, so all this is fully available, uh, freely available within ITS tools. And we also built uh, ITS Lola uh, submission to the MCC which uses the uh, 2019 uh, Karsten Wolf and Torsten Lipke's work on uh, Lola. And then we packaged it as a model checker taking as input the, the filtered models from our own process. Thank you for your attention.